John chapter 4. John chapter 4. So we've taken several different testimonies from different people about Jesus being the, the Christ. And today we're going to look at a different, another testimony of somebody who saw that Jesus is the Messiah. And what were the results? And we'll look at a different... Uh, uh, this teaches us more than just about who Jesus was, by the way. And it teaches us Jesus' approach to... Uh, uh, what? Spreading the gospel, teaching, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, sharing the gospel. Okay. All right, so in, in chapter 4, verse 1, we recall that the Pharisees had approached John about who he was in chapter 1. We recall that they approached... Uh, Jesus about who he was. And then we also recall in the last chapter that some of John's disciples were concerned that Jesus and his disciples were baptizing more people. And, and John makes a statement, said, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. He's talking about himself. You know, Christ having all authority. He is God. You know, John understood who he was. He understood he was not even worthy to undo the latches of his sandals. But, but, uh, and so as he has his disciples bring, saying, they're, they're, they're baptizing more than you. And he says, a man can receive nothing except to be given him. He understood that this mission he was given to prepare the way for the Lord, it was given him from heaven. It was, and it wasn't that he, something he took on himself, but rather he was given that to do. Now as we look at verse 1 of chapter 4, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made them and baptized more disciples than John, Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. That was an interesting question last week. Why was it that Jesus didn't baptize? Of course, we can only speculate on that. But it was, it's made known that his disciples baptized in his stead. But yet the Bible says that Jesus baptized. It tells us that when one does something through an agent, that it, is, it is accurate to say that one does something. In this case, Jesus is said to have been baptizing yet he was using the agency of his disciples. And so as we consider, by what authority do we baptize? Well, as we baptize individually here, it's by the Lord's authority, and it is, of course, the baptism that's commanded by God that comes from Christ and by the instruction of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, as we baptize, it's not by our own, by our own authority or any succession of authority, but rather it's by the authority of Christ. And so in effect... We're baptizing, Jesus is baptizing through any of us who, be, who would be bad, baptizing others. So we don't appeal to a succession of, of authority going way back to the first apostles who baptized those and then they baptized and so forth and so on. That's not required. As a matter of fact, it's, it, uh, it doesn't seem that it's essential that any, any particular one has any kind of credentials to be, to be baptizing. Um, you know, you could have, uh, um, um, I believe it was uh, not Alexander Campbell, but his father. Uh, his, when they were studying, he, he was studying himself out of denominationalism. He realized what the purpose of baptism was. And so he went to the local Baptist preacher and told him he wanted to be baptized for the remission of sins. And this preacher was not very keen on that idea and tried to dissuade him from doing that, but nevertheless, uh, Campbell uh, insisted, and so he reluctantly baptized him, even though he himself was not of the belief that you need to be baptized for remission of sins. But yet, it's, it's un, uh, regard, once again, when one understands why he's being baptized, and he does so with the contrite heart, with the right attitude about appealing to God for forgiveness of sins, that baptism is the one baptism that, that we have today. There's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. Okay. So as we see here, Jesus was baptizing, but not himself, but his disciples were. And so he left Judea and departed again unto Galilee. Why? Because the Pharisees had seen, had heard that Jesus made, was, had baptized more disciples than John. So as they were, the Pharisees were concerned about John being so so successful, and then they see Jesus being more influential, they can see their influence diminishing. And they, that, that whereas they perceive themselves to be the um, shepherds, as it were, 
of, of the religious realm in, in the law of Moses, shepherds over the people, and they saw what they may have perceived was, was uh, they're cutting into our business. Okay. And, and so that was, and so as it was not the time for Jesus to be crucified yet, he departed uh, uh, Judea and went north to Galilee. And as it, as you, when you look at the map, I wish I had put one on the overhead, but as you look at a map, you have Judea in the south where Jerusalem is, and then you have Galilee in the north where Cana is and uh, Capernaum and Nazareth are all are on Galilee. In order to get from Jerusalem to Galilee, you have to cross through Samaria. That's, that's the path he was taking, going through Samaria. A little history about uh, Samaria uh, and Samaritans in particular. Uh, you go back to the days of uh, Nehemiah when he was authorized by Cyrus, the king of Persia, to go down and to rebuild the temple. Actually, to, um, to build, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And the, the Samaritans came out and uh, some of the Samaritans came out, and at first they were deriding him in their efforts. And then they, they, well, they offered to help. And, of course, Nehemiah knew what they were up to. Uh, there was a matter of distraction, trying to prevent them from building the walls of Jerusalem. They didn't like the idea that, that the Jews were building up the walls again. And so they, they, through their various tactics to try to stall things, to get it to stop, they even tried to get Cyrus to, to renege upon his author, authorizing Nehemiah to build the the uh, walls, but, but uh, eventually they were done. But the Samaritans had been, apparently from that time, had been, um, they were at odds with each other, between the Samaritans and Jews. The thing about the Samaritans, they, they you go back in history when the Assyrians invaded uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, and it was their practice, as it was later on the Babylonians, that they would displace those that were in the, any land they conquered it removed them, many of the natives, and then import many of the peoples from other uh, countries they'd conquered. So they'd intermix the people. And then during this time in, in the history of Israel, that was when you, you got a lot of Gentiles coming into the, into the territory and uh, the Jews living side by side with these Gentiles, and they would intermarry. And so you got somewhat of a, a mixed, uh, mixed bloodline. But that wasn't all. Um, that was not all. If you recall Jeroboam having separated himself, the ten northern tribes from the two southern tribes, making the northern kingdom of Israel, that uh, he set up a different order of worship. He, set up, he, he uh, actually made idols. He set up one place in Dan and one place in uh, Beersheba. But the, the idea of it is he realized that if we allow all of our countrymen to go down south to Jerusalem like they're supposed to, they'll once again be drawn in to reunite with the southern king of Judah, and I'll lose my kingdom. I'll lose my influence. I'll lose my authority. They will we'll once again be integrated and uh, consolidated, and I won't, I won't have this kingdom. And so he established a new worship, a new place, a new object of worship. Yes, he used uh, uh, idols. And he established a new priesthood, all these things. And he established a different time. So he changed all these things to try to, to uh, put a stumbling block for those who would want to go down to Jerusalem and, and worship according to the law of Moses. And so introducing, and there were never any righteous kings in, in, in the northern kingdom of Israel. None. At least in, the, in Judah, the southern kingdom, they had some righteous kings. But in, Judah, in Israel, they had none. And so you consider that they had received a lot of false teachings. Okay? And uh, eventually they come to where they, the, the, the Samaritans would not accept the entire Old Testament. They would not uh, accept the teachings of the, from the prophets. They only accepted the first five books, the Pentateuch of the Bible. And interestingly enough, there are passages in, the, in those first five books that refer to the Messiah, the one that would come. In fact, they had a when uh, we re re read about this woman at the well, that she had uh, knew that the, the Messiah would come. But there, it's interesting that they had the, uh, for some reason they had the idea that this Messiah that would come, his name would start with an M, and he'd live to be 120 years. Now, you don't know anybody that did that in the Old Testament, do you? How old was mm, Moses when he died? 
Okay. He's about 120 years old. Okay. It's very interesting how they, so they, were, they had been received all these years some traditions and some things that weren't so, and that's what they were used to hearing. And there, they had, uh, where they were in, in this, uh, this town of uh, uh, Sikar, Sikar in Samaria, that, uh, that was near Jacob's well. That was, a, if you consider it, Jerusalem was a, is a site of a lot of, of uh, Old Testament uh, significant events. You know, it's thought that to Abraham, when he sacrificed Isaac, he went up to that, that, that Mount Zion that, uh, that to offer Isaac. But uh, at the well of Jacob, and Jacob's, you're familiar with Jacob's ladder. Remember when he fell asleep and he, he uh, saw the, the ladder and he dreamed. You also consider uh, that's, it's thought that that's where he strove with God, that he wrestled with an angel of God. Okay. So, and, and so they perhaps had a lot of, of uh, uh, they saw the site as religiously significant. You know. <clears throat> so as we consider, continue on with this, about his have, having to pass through Samaria, he, then, uh, he must go through Samaria. That was the tra- route he had to take, in verse 4. Verse 5, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. <clears throat> Jesus, therefore, being wearied of his journey, that sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So it was, it's, un, it's believed that John was uh, uh, counting things according to Roman time. So when he says about the sixth hour, it's about, it was about 12 o'clock. The idea of being six o'clock being the first hour, because that's when the sun comes up. And... Uh, uh, 12 o'clock being the sixth hour. Um, that wouldn't be right, would it? If it were by Roman time, grew with the Samaria. You come to the city of Samaria, which is called Sacred Part of the Ground. Let's see. Sixth, about the sixth hour. That would have been the, during, the, during the day. So he's coming. It's, if it were the sixth hour, six o'clock in the morning, that would be about mid, uh, early morning. That means they've been walking in the dark. So it's believed that the sixth hour would be about noon, and there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Okay. So, and so she was coming to the well to, to draw from that, apparently several times a day, to, to, to replenish what she needed to do in her home. And there he was, and he asked, asked a favor. Um, you know, sometimes it, uh, you fall more quickly in, into the good graces of other people, not by providing them a favor, but rather asking, them, asking of them to perform a favor for you, because all of a sudden there's that good will being established. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Um, so where, whatever, it was at a time of day that they could go to the market and go buy, go buy food. They're gone away. So then said the woman of Samaria unto him, now here's what's interesting, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Um, that last phrase, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, I think that's a parenthetical uh, narrative comment that John makes to, to clarify why would she ask, how is it you, you uh, ask, ask me a drink of water? I'm, I'm Samaritan, Samaritan. You remember the, 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 the parable of the Good Samaritan? What was so significant about his using the, the fact that it was a Samaritan that aided this, this Jew who had been, had been robbed by the, on, the, on the way to Jericho? What was so significant about it, it was a Samaritan? Well, the fact that it's a Samaritan. Ethan? Huh? Basically, they weren't the same status as everybody else. Right. In fact, the only dealings they had with each other was typically trade. You know, they would trade with one another, but they wouldn't associate with each other. They wouldn't, certainly wouldn't eat a meal together. And the fact, and what lends great uh, uh, effect to that parable is the fact that, that Jesus used Samaritan. Samaritan extended goodwill toward this Jew. You know, who is my neighbor? Well, in the same way, this Samaritan woman is looking, how is it your Jew? Not only are you you're asking a Samaritan, but, but we'll see later as disciples wonder, why is he talking to a woman? Um, we'll discuss that in a moment. So as then said the woman, how is it you, you come to uh, ask me a drink? Well, 
What does that say? You know, Jesus here is reaching out to her. He's really reaching out to her. And you think about, he's not staying within the norm of social relations in two ways. First, he's, he's talking to a woman, which is unusual. In fact, uh, under the Jewish culture, the, the, the men were not to interact with women on the street in public, even, even men with their wives. It's just not done. Okay. And that wasn't unusual to the Jewish culture. It was all around. That was the normal aspect of, of how men would regard women, okay, and that, that they were not. In fact, many of the cultures regarded women more as property, okay. The second class citizen. In fact, that, prob- that attitude probably lent itself to being able to put your wife away for any cause. Remember Matthew 19, when the Pharisees asked, can a man put away his wife for any cause? Thinking that Deuteronomy 24, verse 4, authorized the men to just, I'm tired of my wife, I'm going to write her a bill of divorce, there you go, you're gone. I mean, that was the, that was the attitude, and they, that's probably what they had, the thinking that, well, Moses allowed them to divorce their wife for any cause. I can just get rid of her so I can find somebody else. You know? And, of course, that, Jesus straightened them out. He went right back to the very beginning about this. And, and here is Jesus talking to a woman. You realize, Jesus being God, why did God create woman? How did he create woman in the sense of, in what, man, what fashion was she made? Well, she, like Adam, was made in the image of God. We know not physically. When, he, when it speaks about, Jesus speaks about our being made in the image of God, it doesn't mean we're physically like God, but rather our spirit. Many aspects of our spirit are very similar to those of God. When I say very similar, we're made in his image. Um, of course, we being created beings, and we're, of course, lesser than God, but yet uh, we have the various uh, natural aspects in our, in our being. Um, uh, reason, logic, love, you know, emotions and, and intellect, uh, will, all these things that, uh, that uh, because that's how God made us. And God made woman that way too. Not to be demeaned and, and you know, you've heard that don't, you don't wipe your feet off your, your wife like a doormat. You know, you don't treat your wife like a doormat. And that's exactly what Jesus was, was, was he wasn't treating her like a doormat. or He wasn't treating her like the norm of, of she's a lesser, lesser critter than I am, okay? And so, um, as he's speaking to her, um, and then her being a Samaritan, so he can, engages her in a conversation. And so she's wondering, why is it you're asking me? And Jesus answered and said, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Of course, this is sounding... This kind of a casual conversation, somewhat, and he asks for her water, says, and her response is, well, who are you? You know, she's saying that he, she probably brought her bucket and her rope because there weren't any supplies there from home. So she brought it to, to draw water. And here Jesus was sitting there, a Jew, and needing water. He didn't have anything to draw. So, and her question is, well, well, who are you? you know? and, and says, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for water, and I'd give you living water. Well, her thinking of this conversation more still on the, 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 just like in Nicodemus, when Jesus said, you must be born again, he was still thinking on the physical plane. So too was this woman in her conversation, was still thinking on the physical plane. In fact, perhaps that this comment she made would stop the conversation altogether. You know, the woman saith unto him, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? In other words, what, what are you talking about? What are you talking about getting this living water? You don't have anything to draw from. Uh, art thou greater than our father Jacob? Of course, we understand Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob being the son of Abraham, of the bloodline of Christ, of the bloodline of the Messiah. And says, are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? So we have a history here. J- our father Jacob, he, he dug this well. He drank from this well. All his descendants drank from his well. We watered our, our livestock. And who are you? You know, Art thou greater than our, our father Jacob? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. So he's not, he's, he's, uh, 
brushing aside any kind of any kind of uh, uh, criticism that she might have of him, or you know his his uh, his uh, you know that that uh, you know who does he think he is? You know, he's brushing all that aside. And he's he's still forging in with with the the uh, what he wants to impart. Whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again. And he's still speaking of a spiritual matter in a figurative way. But whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in the well, him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So he's distinguishing the water that you draw from this, this uh, well between what the well of water that he was going to give her. Okay. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. There's, yeah, I get that sounds great. I don't have to come out here anymore. Still, again, a uh, comment you might uh, expect from someone who wanted to cut off that conversation. Okay. Well, Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. So, perhaps as she's departing, he says, Go call your husband. Bring him here. Yes. Mm-hmm. But when he talks about the living water that he gives, is he just referring to the salvation that we receive, or is he referring to that fulfillment that we get that only comes from God because we have a relation, like as we study his word? You know, there's a part that only God can fill that overflows from us mm-hmm. as we fill ourselves up with him. Mm-hmm. Is that, I mean, is that the water? Is he talking about like the... I think it's the word of God. I think it's the, the, you know, as he's going around teaching what? Repent ye for the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, he's bringing a way of salvation. And I think it, those, he, remember when, when uh, he taught something really hard that uh, a lot of people, those disciples turned away, no longer followed after him again. And uh, he turned to his disciples and said, will you also leave me? And what did Peter say? To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. I think that's what he's talking about, the words of life, living water. And he's using this, this as, an, as an, uh, an angle, if you will, an opening, opening a door and, and getting her interest to discuss some things. And he starts it with where they are, talking about here we are, the water. Um, and and, and uh, he's guiding it into a more deeper conversation. As water, well, no, he talked about he is the water that that. Well, that's I mean, he's the word. he is the, the the water that provided the. He's that rock that provided the water. You know, um, I think he's referring to the words of life that he he would uh, bring to her, uh, that living water, as he said, and brings uh, water spring up. Uh, but the water that I should give him shall be in a, him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. I think that uh, that's what the Word of God does. Yeah, it, you know, the Word of God is alive and active. It's quick and active, uh, sharper than any two-edged sword. And I, I think that's just what he's referring to. As far as what happens when we obey the gospel and what happens with our relationship with God and what happens when... Uh, as we've learned the gospel, we know what to do. And so what do we do? We share the same thing. We teach somebody else how to find everlasting life. I think that those are wells of living water. Okay. But I, don't, I, don't, I think that, that he's just talking about the words in themselves that bring us life. Uh, the word is able to make us wise into salvation. Um, uh, that, that's all. But, A wa- Satisfying, satiating, dr- uh, quenching your thirst. Man, there's a need that only God can fill. That I think even her being there, he knew that she was. Okay. There was a deeper need that was hollow within her. Okay. Know, that she was, you know, we all search for mm-hmm. that that meaning in life, that that purpose. That well, they say that there is some a need for man to worship something. Right. And and. Uh, I think that's true. Even those that, that, that deny any God at all, 
that everything is just physical in the way that it is, that what you see is what you get. I think they still, they still worship their philosophy. They still worship, you, you're familiar with humanism that sets man himself up as a god. Um, and, and, and so there is a, they say a need to worship something. Um, of course, we are being social beings too. We need to have interaction. But, but as far as the, the water satiates the thirst, it satisfies it, it quenches the thirst. And so one who has that need, that, that thirst to be quenched, that's an interesting correlation. Um, okay. So she said, okay, give me the water that, you, that you're talking about so I don't have to come back here anymore. Sort of like a, okay, I've had, I'm, I'm ready to stop this conversation. And so he says, go call your husband and come hither. Well, Jesus knew what he was doing. That's showing the, the omniscience of God, the omniscience of Jesus. He knew what her life had been. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. And he's going to explain why. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that sets thou truly. All right, so Jesus knew what sort of woman she is, right? And he's talking to her, trying to draw her in to teach her about himself. What sort of woman was she? Five husbands, and now she's living with somebody? And yet Jesus is approaching her and trying to call her back? You know, um, as we consider our responsibility to f in, our, in fulfilling the commission to spread the gospel, we'll meet people that are not what we would consider ideal candidates in obedience to the gospel, ideal candidates who would hear the spiritual matters. You know, Sometimes we think, well, they wouldn't fit in with us. Isn't that amazing that we would have an attitude that, well, they won't fit in with us. That's not, that didn't stop Jesus. Every, everyone God calls, and everyone should be given opportunity to be called through the gospel. And so no matter how we might perceive others, usually we're wrong. You know. We don't know if somebody will uh, take to it, in a manner of speaking. We don't know if somebody will reject it. We don't know if somebody... In fact, some of the times the most unlikely candidates that we would consider in, in hearing and obeying the gospel are the most uh, uh, probable in obeying the gospel. We don't know what's going on inside somebody. We can only see what's going on, on the outside. We look at s things on the outside. And, and uh, to think that, uh, you know, <clears throat> how many people did Jesus speak with that were in sin? Zacchaeus, a publican who was probably involved with, uh, um, well, cheating, basically. Uh, the woman caught in adultery that they brought to Jesus said, should, should we stone her? We'll talk about that in the book of John. What did he do? Well, he didn't condemn her because he, he wasn't an eyewitness to it. But he knew what they were doing. They were setting her up as, as the, the fall gal uh, for their, their whole uh, scheme to try to trick Jesus. But uh, he said, go and sin no more. Uh, and this woman here, who having five husbands and now is living with somebody who's she, to whom she's not married, and uh, yet he's reaching out to her, giving her the opportunity. So as we, so we think about our responsibilities, sometimes we just don't know. And so we shouldn't. It would be, it would be a mistake for us to, to just presuppose and think that, oh, he wouldn't be interested, she wouldn't be interested, or there's no way I can ever reach them, or there's no way they're ever to listen to it or obey it. You know, we don't know. And, and what's more, it's not our responsibility to believe for them. It's only our responsibility to relate the gospel message. And so uh, we, sh we should never prejudge. I say we should never. I, it would be, I mean, obviously we don't throw our, our pearls before swine. That's not what I'm saying. 
But uh, here Jesus was talking to a woman that, that turned out, as we, what we recall, she was, she was quite a, uh, a rich candidate, I guess you might say, um, in the sense of her response. And so as he talks to her, verse 18, For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband, and that saidst thou truly. Now the woman, her ears are pricking up now. Said, Whoa. The woman saith unto him, Ah, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. What else conclusion could she come to? She doesn't know this guy from Adam. <laughs> and, uh, and here he was telling her all about her life. Of course, he, he told her enough that she knew. He didn't tell her everything about her life, everything she ever did, but he, he told her enough that, how does he know these things? Except he'd be a prophet. In verse 20, our, and so instead of going further into that, she sort of sidesteps the issue. Something more perhaps of a comfortable topic to talk about. That was a to- hot topic of the day between Samaritans and Jews. Think about, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. You say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. There is a contention here. They, the Samaritans, worshipped where they were, in the mountain. Okay. Whereas the Jews said, no, you've got to go to Jerusalem to worship. Well, that's the truth. All the prophets said, go to Jerusalem to, to worship. As, as, and, of course, they had not taken Jerusalem yet when Moses got the law, received the law from God on Mount Sinai. But... Uh, as time went on, it was clear they were to go to Jerusalem to worship. In fact, the feast that they were to go worship in. Okay, the woman said, uh, "See, so our fathers worship here, but you say go worship in Jerusalem." Okay. Well, Jesus said, "Now notice, he doesn't min- he doesn't dodge the issue. That was an issue. There is a distinction. There's a difference between what the Samaritans believed and worshiping on their mountain, there where the Jacob's well was." And going down Jerusalem, like the prophet said, they didn't accept that. So, but he doesn't sidestep it. He deals with it. He saith unto her, woman, and that's not a, a deriv- the title of derision. Remember when Jesus referred to his mother as woman, it was not disrespectful or anything like that, but rather as a term of endearment. And so as he addresses this woman in a, in a respectful way, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. So he's, so he's saying, well, that's not the real issue where we worship now. There's something more important you know, he's going around preaching, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he's discussing an aspect of the kingdom of heaven. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So whereas they had the prophets and relying upon the word of God, the inspired word of God, they didn't. So what they worshiped and what they did was out of ignorance. And, but whereas the Jews were worshiping according to the law of Moses in not in ignorance, but, but in knowledge. And so as whereas he's saying, we know what we're worshiping. We know we, it, all, it comes from God, and salvation is of the Jews. Salvation was of the Jews because the Christ came from the bloodline of Jesus, and the law of Moses was, was pointing out sin, and it was condemning sin. But he goes on from there. Instead of sticking with that, he, he, he deals with the issue, but he goes on to what the real issue is. But the hour cometh and now is. So it's not just what hey, we've been doing all along, but now things have changed. When the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Why? For the Father seeketh such to worship him. And here's the, the point, that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God is spirit. There's no, just as Solomon understood, that the temple couldn't contain God. He knew that it, it didn't contain God. He knew that. It was, it was a house built with hands, and it was, it was, I mean, the God of the universe, that he can be uh, confined in a, in a small building, a, a large building, it, it just doesn't uh, fit. And so, as God, as God is a spirit, to so those that worship him, they have to worship a spirit in a spiritual way, uh, by, the, by understanding and knowledge, and, 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 and it's not by accident, okay, it's purposing. To worship the Father in spirit and in truth, truth according to the the, the uh, word of God. Remember Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, John seventeen seventeen, sanctify them by thy truth. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. The truth, the God's word is the truth. And so, as we worship in truth, it's by the word of God, and in worshiping in spirit, it's it's so the fact that. Uh, you know, you can, you can imagine going to, to a temple and worshiping idols. That's okay. I, I don't mean that. I mean, that, that makes sense. 
that idols, they're so small, that you can go to, they have a location, but God is spirit. And uh, so, so to be consistent with the nature of God, we have to worship him in a, system, in a way that is consistent with his nature so that we're not, we're not confined to a location. Rather, it's our method and our attitude. So as God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's right now. Not to say that that as they were worshiping God at the temple that they were not worshiping in truth or that they were not worshiping in spirit, but that but that the issue isn't where, but it's but it's how and with the what attitude. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Interesting topic here, because now he's getting around what he really wants to get to. He's talking about he's got the living water. He's, and and uh, he dealt with the sidestepping issue that she had, but now she talks about Messiah. Aha, that's the key. And so Jesus said to her, I that speak unto thee am he. Here I am. That's when he goes back. If you knew who was asking you to, to give you water, you'd ask me for water. And so he says, and then so he gets right down to it. Finally, I'm the Messiah, the one you should ask for living water from. Um, and upon this, his disciples marveled that he would talk with a woman. That is very, so he, it wasn't that she was a Samaritan necessarily, but also that he was talking it publicly with a woman. Yet no man said, why seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? So they respected him enough not to, I mean, he was their master, he was their teacher. And so they respected him, and they didn't, they didn't come out and say, why, what are you talking to her for? So the woman let, then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, come, see a man which told me all things, whatever I did. Is not this the Christ? Um, so, um, in having spoken with this woman, that she now has been so impressed, she believes, apparently she believes he's Messiah. He said so specifically, and it had, had uh, demonstrated it somewhat with telling her about her own life. And so she, she goes and tells the other men in the city, in Sikor, about, about this. And the question is, is phrased in such a way that a negative answer was to be expected. You know, we, we do that sometimes. Is it not the case? What we're saying is, surely this is, this is what should be done. And so this question is, is asked, phrased in such a way that, surely this is not the Christ. But it may have been because... Showing too much zeal or could have uh, diminished the, the men's interest or thought, oh, no, it can't be. You know? or if, but at any rate, and so she had said, come and see. Come and see. You remember Nathaniel? He said, come and see. You don't believe it? Come and see. That's all we have to say most of the time. Come and see. You know, you come and see what, come and hear what the teaching is. Come and hear the preaching. Hear, hear what the Bible says. Find out for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Find out for yourself. Come and hear what the word has to say. And, and uh, so uh, they went out of the city and they came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed, prayed him, saying, Master, eat. This is very So obviously they had been, just been walking all day. They came into town and he, they were tired. They were hungry. You know, Jesus sat at the well probably to, to rest, and get a drink of water perhaps. And as his disciples went off to get something to eat, there, this conversation in, ensues. And so they're still hungry. He said, you got to eat. You know, they're watching out for his welfare. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Um, and so there's something they didn't understand. Here's a case where he's, he's dealing with the spiritual matter too. And they're still thinking on this physical plane. I have food to eat. And so they asked, in verse 33, therefore said his disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Did, some, who, did you give him any food? <laughs> did somebody come by and give him a, a hot dog or something? And uh, what Jesus said to them, plainly, he says, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That's what feeds me. That's, um, You ever talk with somebody on scriptural matters, and you—it was they were, 
They were persuaded of what the Bible said was right. How, what a thrill it was that they were, they saw the truth and lights were going on in, in, their, in their head, you know, in their eyes. And, and, and you got the greatest thrill because you were used by the Lord to do his work. And that's what he's, his, Jesus was doing the will of the Father, and that was so much, uh, gra- so gratifying to him that even eating and drinking w- w- didn't, it w- didn't match up to that. And then as you consider that this woman had brought, called all these men out uh, of the city, right, and said, come, see, come and see. And so as they were coming up to Jesus, okay, Jesus is now talking to to his disciples, and say, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Oh. You know, you could see, you go out a crop, you get an idea of when it was planted, you know how big those plants are, and if you're involved with agriculture, and you're, as you walk from Judah th- through Samaria to Galilee, you cross by all these fields, wheat fields, or whatever, whatever grains or crops they had, you could see, oh, I can see that... The, there are probably about four more months before we had the harvest. There's about six months between sowing the seed and harvesting it. And you can look out and see how the plants are growing. Well, that's, and so by the sign of what they saw, well, we can wait about four more months because before we have to really work hard to get out in these fields. Okay. But behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. Take a look at all these people coming up here. Look at all these people that this woman has called up. She says, behold, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. He's talking about the fields of Humanity, fields of people, for they are white all ready to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit in the life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is the saying that true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap, that whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. So Jesus says, look at all these people coming up. The harvest is ready. You are going to be able to, I'm sending you out to reap from this, these crops, reap from the harvest that's here before us, what? To draw men unto Christ, to bring them to salvation, to call, call them to repentance, and to, for, to baptism, as, it, as they were calling them, to uh, uh, turn away from the, the life they had lived, to turn back to God as he intended it, for them, and they were reaping crops they had not planted. Others had planted before them. Others had planted before them, and they are, and so as they were reaping the crops that others had planted, the two rejoiced together. As he said, and here is a saying that true: that one soweth, another reapeth. Okay. <coughs> In verse thirty-six, and he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gather fruit unto life eternal. That both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. As we consider that uh, persuading one to obey the gospel sometimes takes multiple efforts. You've heard the phrase, it takes a village, right? Well, sometimes you can see that one person works in in planting the seed and and harvesting the crop of that, that one planted seed, that one hearing the gospel and obeying it. But other times it just takes... Uh, separate efforts in the case of one who had planted and seeded there they were prepared and the one who was the ones who were reaping and as we see they did reap because they uh, verse 39 and many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for the saying of the woman was testified he told me all that I ever did okay and so as you as they had responded to this in the teaching, they were reaping the crops that others had planted. That tells you something about the importance of Bible class teachers. Because they will be planting the seed that will come to harvest of fruition as that young child grows up through the years and realizes when, when he has, becomes the age of accountability, realizes sin how bad it is and the consequences of it and that he needs forgiveness of sins, all of a sudden, I shouldn't say all of a sudden, but that young child, that young child growing up to the youth and, 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 and the seed has been planted, ready for the harvest. And that's uh, through a multitude of efforts by many people, many teachers and people in the congregation okay, and parents 
all these things working together, planting the seed, harvesting it. You know, even Paul said, I, I planted, but Apollos watered, but God giveth the increase. Okay. So they under, I mean, the, it's, it's a fact that we all work together in the sense of planting the seed and harvesting as bringing one to repentance and, and uh, obedience to the gospel. Um, and in verse 4, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he bowed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. So there was the testimony of this woman who said, surely he's a prophet. Could he be the Christ? I think she thought he was, because he said plainly to her he was the, he was the Messiah. Um, <clears throat> and then because of her calling people to come here, they reaped a great harvest because, uh, because of that woman's, uh, interestingly enough, evangelizing. Now it's, it's interesting, you think about as a new convert, it's probably because one obeys the gospel, he's excited. This is, for the first time in his life, he realizes he has real forgiveness of sins. And that really is the first time he has forgiveness of sins and his obedience to the gospel. How exciting it is when someone to tell every, everyone, I obey the gospel. I found eternal life. I want the same for you. And in the zeal of a new convert, a lot of things can happen. Uh, take advantage of that energy and that zeal. Because uh, that, that new convert can bring more people in than, uh, than uh, uh, the most seasoned preacher sometimes. Because of the, the zeal, the interest. As this woman, can this be the Christ? And so they're here, okay, let's go find out. So we've hit the, the end of the, the, the hour, actually a little beyond, but uh, are there any comments or questions or thoughts regarding what we've gone over tonight, today, this morning? Don't tell me I've done that good of a job. <laughs> I appreciate your interest, and I know I, I, was, I was talking a lot, but, but uh, I, I can tell that uh, uh, you're showing a, a good interest. I appreciate that. Thanks. We'll, we'll continue on next week with, with the. Uh, um, well, let's do for, uh, 42 to finish up the whole thought. And said unto the woman, as oh, in verse 41, and many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Hmm? Well, yeah, yeah. They listened to what he had to say, and they were, they were, yeah. Faith cometh through hearing. Exactly. Right. It, it didn't require a miracle. Some people have believed because of the miracles. Yeah. Yeah. But these people believe because of what he said. Faith cometh through hearing, hearing by the word of God.